you have a Bible, or if you have a telephone, turn to the, the book of 3rd John today. I'm going to read this to us. The, a first grade school teacher had 21 students in her class. She presented each child in her classroom the first half of a well-known proverb and asked them to come up with the rest of the proverb. These are the results. Strike while the bug is close. <laughs> it's always darkest before daylight savings time. Never underestimate the power of termites. Don't bite the hand that looks dirty. A miss is as good as a mister. You can't teach an old dog new math. If you lie down with the dogs, you'll stink in the morning. Love all, trust me. An idle mind is the best way to relax. Where there's smoke, there's pollution. A penny saved is not much. Anyway. We began a series a couple weeks ago. We were talking about the importance of community. And I just want to review a few things that we've already talked about, and then we're going to launch into the rest. We began by asking the question, in 2023, do you feel like you were thriving or just surviving? Do, do you feel like you're moving forward and, and growing or just trying to survive the challenges? Now, now, life is going to have challenges from time to time. From every one of us, I don't care, or for every one of us, I don't care who you are. But I, I really believe that God created us to thrive no matter what's going on around us. And we don't ever have to settle for just surviving. As we launch into 2024, we're going to talk about several things over the next few weeks that make the difference, I believe, between thriving or just surviving. And one of those things is community. You know, there's a reason that we have an emphasis on small groups as we head into 2024. Because we all need community. God has just wired us that way. We, we, we are our best in community. In fact, we thrive in community. Now, our, our verse that we kind of begin this series with, I want to read it. Third John, there's only one chapter in this book, verse 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Let's pray. Father God, you desire good things for us. Open our hearts today to receive from you. Let us be empowered by your word. Let revelation come by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we just want to know you. We want to understand the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. That you may prosper in all things. The word prosper is defined as to be successful, to, to progress well, to thrive to flourish. The, the, the part of the definition, as I was looking in my, my, my Greek concordance, the, the, the part that caught my attention was to progress well. And the idea is, as you are walking along this path that God has you on, that it will go well with you on the journey. Now, when I say the word prosperity, I know many different thoughts come to mind. And the world's definition of prosperity is very different from God's. Well, we, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but let me give you this in your notes. God doesn't just want you to survive. He wants you to thrive. Amen. The Bible is filled with scriptures that, that clearly indicate that God wants 
us to thrive. He wants things to go well with you in every area of your life. In fact, the, the Bible is filled with the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom of, of how to navigate life. And when we apply that wisdom, things go well for us. Now, the word thrive is very similar to the word prosper. By definition, the word thrive means to prosper or, or be successful, to grow or develop vigorously, to flourish. The word thrive is an aggressive word. It's an aggressive forward movement taking ground. God wants you and I to thrive. God wants your family to thrive. Now, the word prosperity, it's an interesting word because it implies more than enough. Prosperity is more than enough. Amen. An abundance, an overflow. It's not just affecting me, it's affecting those around me. When, when I thrive, there is an abundance in my life, and that abundance overflows to others. A person who is prosperous from a biblical perspective is a person who has such a relationship with God that they can tap into heaven, into the kingdom, into the resources of God, not just to meet their own needs. I mean, that is where it begins, but also to meet the needs of others. Prosperity is beautifully described by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Uh, let me just read it. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. I love that verse. God is able to do this in your life, in my life, and it comes from his grace abounding toward us. Everything that... that we, we receive from God comes by his grace. Salvation is by grace through faith. Everything that we need comes by grace. It, 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 we are saved by grace through faith. The grace for healing is tapped into by faith. The grace for prosperity is tapped into by faith. Faith is a conviction about the nature of God, what he is like. It is a conviction based on who he is and what he has declared in his word. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now, now we're, we're talking about not just God meeting our needs, but, but God meeting other people's needs through our lives. God wants to bring us to the place where we not only have a sufficiency for ourselves, that, that's the beginning point. Tapping into God to see our needs met is where it starts, but that's just the beginning. Prosperity takes it to another level. A level you not only have all sufficiency in all things, but also you have an abundance for every good work. Every situation that, that, that God brings you into. That's prosperity right there. This verse defines prosperity. By the way, this is your memory verse for the month of January 2024. Uh, can you put that up on the screen one more time? Let, let's just say this together. And God is able... I'll give you a, a second to do that. Sorry. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. You know, what I love to do is I, I read my Bible, and, and it's kind of like soaping because a portion of Scripture will, come, will jump out at me. Or sometimes I, I'll, I'll see a Scripture and I think, you know, I need to spend some time with that. And I'll, I'll get a three by five card and I'll write it out. Sometimes I'll write it out in an app that I have on my phone so that I have it with me always. I'll put it up on my bathroom mirror so that every time I shave, every time I brush my teeth, I see it. And, and you know, when I memorize a verse of scripture, I don't try to memorize it. I just read it out loud over and over again. Like I, I sometimes I even put it in my car. You know, so I, I'll see this verse of scripture and I'll say, and God is able to make all grace 
abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. And, and as, I, as, it, as I begin to memorize it, then, I, then I'm taking it with me any place I go, even when I'm closing my eyes to sleep at night. And I'm saying, God, make this word come alive in me. Show me what you're saying. Show me how this applies to me. And giving him opportunity to quicken it. See, what happens with the word, you know, Sarah has chickens. Which means she has eggs. Did you see the price of eggs at Walmart? I couldn't believe it. We're talking of 18 eggs for $8 and some odd cents. And I'm thinking, I need some chickens. But the thing about a chicken, if the egg is, uh, if the egg is germinated, there's an incubation process for that egg, for that to be birthed. And the word of God is very much like that. Sometimes... I'll take a verse of scripture that God hasn't particularly quickened to me, but I'm just thinking there's something there and I want it. And so I'll, I'll incubate it. I'll spend time with it and I'll say, Holy Spirit, speak this word to me. Make this come alive in me. And see, all of a sudden you hatch Lagos into Rhema. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The Lagos is the word in general, all of it. The rhema is when God speaks it to you. And, and once that happens, then I just personalize it. In fact, I've got a slide, Krista, with me, with a, us just personalizing that particular verse of scripture. We take out the you's and we, we replace them with me and I. So let's try it. And God is able to make all grace abound toward me, that I, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now, when I do that, I'm not trying to psych myself up into believing something. That, that, that's far from what I'm thinking. I am declaring the truth of God's word over my life. I'm declaring what God says about me. I'm declaring that over my life and over my circumstances. Now, when you hear the word prosperity, if you're thinking about money, you're missing it. You're missing it. You don't understand it yet. Prosperity is tapping into God's resources to meet the needs of others. Not every need people have is financial. You know, Jesus walked and lived out of the kingdom of God. He was not limited by the lack that he encountered because he was tapped into another source that he was living out of. And he was able to, to take a, a boy's lunch and feed thousands of people with that lunch. He was able to heal the sick that he came in, in contact with. He was able to cleanse lepers, to raise the dead. Prosperity is so much more than money. Money is a very limited commodity. Now, when, when you need money, it's great to have. It's wonderful. Uh, Jesus, one time Peter, you know, was trying to figure out whether he's supposed to pay taxes or not, and Jesus sent him fishing. And he said, out of the mouth of the first fish, you'll find the money. You know, money is not a problem for God. But, but money is a limited commodity in itself. Prosperity is the ability to tap into healing and release it into other people's lives. It's the ability to speak a much needed word of encouragement to the person who is discouraged. Or to, or to put food in the stomach of someone that's hungry. Now in your notes, prosperity is the ability to tap into God's ability to meet the needs of others. When the Bible says that, that God wants you to prosper... It means so much more than just having to do with money, which is how the world defines prosperity. Money is a limited resource. When the Bible talks about prosperity, it's talking about doing well in everything related to life. That, that, that things will go well in every facet of your life. That you may prosper in all things and be in health even as your soul prospers. 
So let's apply this to the area that we're talking about today. When we talk about the area of community, we're talking about your natural family. We're talking about your spiritual family. We're talking about relationships. To understand what it is, let's put this label on it. We're talking about relational prosperity. Prospering relationally. It's a big one. God wants us to prosper in all things and be in health even as our soul prospers. Do you, do you believe that God wants you to be healthy? That, that he wants you to be in health even as your soul prospers? Yes. Amen. Do you believe that God wants you to prosper in all things? Yes. Now, now see, the reason I even ask that question is that sometimes we, we don't. Sometimes we, we have all kinds of doubts about ourselves or, or different things. You know, I can see why God would want to heal everybody, but... But me. But see, that's why it's so important to be renew transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. If you, if you want to know the will of God, you renew your mind with the word of God. And, it, and, and see, all of a sudden, if you really believe that God wants to bless you, you will pray with great confidence. You will pray... Pray with great excitement. You'll, you'll pray like that kid sitting on his daddy's lap saying, Daddy, Daddy, I want, I, I need. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even as your soul prospers. What is relational prosperity? It is doing relationships well. Where God's grace flows into our relationships. And really, it's the most important kind of prosperity. It's really the one that matters the most. When you and I leave this planet, we will not be taking with us anything except the relationships that we have developed. Your most important relationship is your relationship with God. The relationship that you have developed with him over time. And also the relationships that you have developed with others. Those are the most important things. We can strengthen those relationships. We can be intentional about making, developing, growing, healthy connections. And really, that's what small groups are about. In your notes, relational prosperity is the most important kind of prosperity. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have in the natural. If you are prospering relationally, life is good. Now, I feel like I need to say that again. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have in the natural. If you are prospering relationally, life is good. Why is relational prosperity the most important kind of prosperity? Because when our relationships are healthy, that, that health flows into every area of our lives. Healthy community is God's desire for us. Now, I, I know the word that, that the word community is not in the Bible. But the word communion is. The word community comes from the same root word. We are encouraged to have communion with God, but we're also encouraged to have communion or fellowship with each other. We, we're talking about the kind of relationships where, where we're walking together. We, we do life together. We're, we're walking through this together. A community, when I say that word, it, it defines a group of people in communion with each other, they have a, a fellowship with each other, they have relationship, and they're walking through life together. Because at the end of the day, when we grow in our relationship with each other, this is amazing, but we also grow in our relationship with God. There is a correlation between the two that, 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 that can't be removed. I cannot love God and hate my brother. I'm deceiving myself. I'm fooling myself. My love for God is somehow expressed in how I do relationships. If I say I love God, but I'm not walking in love towards my brothers and sisters, I'm actually lying. I'm deceiving myself. My love for him is expressed in my love for my brothers and sisters. Jesus said this, this is my commandment, 
that you love one another. That is the commandment of the new covenant. This is my commandment that you love one another, that you walk in healthy community with each other. See, when, let, let me take us to the very beginning of the scriptures. Man, I can't believe how much time I have left. This is amazing, Samuel. Yeah. Wow. I, I, most Sundays I feel like I'm just fighting the clock, you know, but we have extra time. <laughs> that is the commandment of the new covenant. This is my commandment that you love one another, that you walk in healthy community with each other. Now, see, when God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he came alive. It was an amazing day. He was the only human being on the planet, but there's a clear indication from the scriptures that he was lonely, that he was missing something, that he needed a companion. At least God seemed to think so. So God brought all the animals before him and he, he named every one of them, but a companion for him was not found among them. You know, pets are nice. Animals are nice, but that's not community. You know, when I was a Boy Scout, my first merit badge was my pet's merit badge. And it wasn't like I had to do anything extra to get it. I, I'd already done it. And I didn't just raise cats and dogs. I raised rats, mice, guinea pigs, hamsters, you name it. You know, I raised them, and, and, I, and that's not even mentioning all the reptiles that I had. But, but pets are nice. A dog, a cat can be wonderful in a home, but it wasn't enough for Adam. An animal cannot satisfy your need for community. We all need community. We need family. We need connection. There's something powerful about community. It's actually healing to our lives. It helps us to become whole. It's not good for man to be alone. No one does well alone. No one does well in this place. You were not created for solitude. We were created for community. In fact, we were created to thrive in community. Genesis 2.18, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. We were not created to live our life in isolation. It's not a healthy place to live. And the word thing is, I know this is true. When people are struggling, the natural tendency is to isolate. Because I don't want you to see me struggling. When in reality, it's the worst thing we can do. And we end up putting ourselves in this place where the enemy can mess with us. It's not the sheep that's in the flock that the wolf goes after. It's, the, it's that sheep that has wandered away from the flock, the, the isolated one. That's who the enemy goes after. The very best thing that you can do when you're struggling is to gather together with other believers in community. The, the best way to get a healthy perspective back is to connect with others, not to isolate. God decided to give Adam some company, so he created Eve. And so that was the first community that the world saw. Just two of them living together in the garden, living in communion with God and with each other. That is, until that fateful day when man fell. And there was, there was an isolation that came with the fall. Not just an isolation from God, but an isolation that affects man and how we do relationships in a very guarded way. See, now we have 8.1 billion people living on this planet. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about that are alive right now. Yeah. I'm not talking about all the people that have lived and died. Somebody said this, and I think it's accurate. There are actually more people that are alive today than have lived and died. Isn't that interesting to think about that? Sounds like a time for a great harvest to me. Amen. So there's 8.1 billion people 
It doesn't seem like anyone should be lonely. But there are lots of lonely people everywhere. Loneliness is a major problem in our society. It, it is still not good for man to be alone. In our culture today, people tend to get so wrapped up in their own lives and all the things that they're trying to do that they don't really take the time to get to know others. Oh, they might mingle a little bit here and there or catch up in the break room at work on a few things, but it isn't real authentic community. Every one of us needs authentic community. Health flows into our lives by being in community. It's in community that we are challenged to grow up. Now, we all know that it's important to spend time with God, soaking his, in his word, communing with him, but he doesn't intend for us to live in isolation from others. He specifically designed us to desire and to crave community and to thrive in relationship with others. We are our best self when we are experiencing life's highs and lows with other believers. That means everyone, whether you're single or married, everyone needs community. But, but don't just take it from me. The Bible has a lot to say about this topic. But first, let's define community. What is community anyway? It comes from the same root word, this is in your notes, as the word communion. Now, the word communion is defined as the interchange or sharing of thoughts or emotions. The, the, the act of sharing or holding in common something that you share in common, like faith. The interchange or sharing of thoughts or emotions. Now, it also is from the same root word as the word communicate. This is in your notes, too. To impart knowledge or make known, to divulge, to give to another, or, or to give or exchange thoughts, feelings, information, to express ideas. So in your notes again, I've got lots of notes here. Community it is a place where there is a conversing, where it's conversing or talking together on an intense or intimate level, an interchanging of thoughts and feelings, a, a making known, a, a divulging, a, an opening up. Community is, is a place to know others and to be known. It's a place for others to know you and for you to know them. And there's something so powerful in that. When I first got saved, I, there's a lot of things I didn't understand about how church worked. But, you know, I, I, everybody was so excited about God. I was excited about God. That, that was for sure. But I was also struggling in some areas. And I, I really, I didn't know how to share that with somebody. One of the powerful things about Celebrate Recovery is, is just that, that opening up, that, that vulnerability. That, that's such a powerful thing. And I remember being in this small group, you know, and I mean, I'm struggling with my thoughts a little bit. I'm struggling in different areas, but I, did, I didn't want to tell anybody because I was afraid they'd, you know, think, think bad of me or something. So I'm in this small group, and this guy breaks down, and he begins to pour out his heart and share the things he's struggling with. And nobody in the group did that. But you know what they did? They, they gathered around him. They laid hands on him. They prayed for him. They spoke words of encouragement to him. They shared scripture with him. They let him know that they were going to be standing with him. And I just thought, this is amazing. You see, I, I went to junior high. Do you remember junior high, Dave? You know, there was all these cliques. There was the jocks. There was the, there was the, uh, <laughs> there was the hoods. There was the druggies. All these different cliques. And the thing about a clique was, you had to be like them to be part of the clique. You, you had to act. And, and so I, I was in several cliques, so when I was with these guys, I kind of acted like this. But then I, over here, I had to act, act like this. And the revelation I got that day in small group is this. I don't have to act like anybody except me. I can actually 
be myself. I can be known and, and also know others. And that was such a powerful thing to me. I, I was channel surfing on a Saturday about six or seven years ago. And I came upon a program on PBS. It was a program on the importance of community, the, the significance of community. Now, it was not a Christian program. It was totally secular. But they were talking about how disconnected our society has become. They were describing the culture of our society 60, 70 years ago. And they said families used to live together and stay together. They were talking about parents and children and grandparents. Fam family was such an important part of life, and they did life together. And they were saying it's, it's really not like that today. They were saying that today, when, when your children graduate from college, there's no telling where they will end up geographically. The strategy of a lot of larger companies is to relocate people to a place where they have no support structure other than their job and the people they associate with. And their thinking is, this breeds loyalty to the company. I, I'm so thankful I have, I have children living in town. I get to know my grandkids. But, but I know so many people that that's not the case. In this PBS program, they were saying that families are, are disconnected from each other. Children don't live in the same city as their parents. Thus, grandparents, grandchildren don't know their grandparents, at least like they did, uh, you know, 70 years ago. Now, in this program, they also talked about how our society is cocooning. How many have heard that term? Cocooning. Raleigh and I. Okay, good. Well, let me define it. Cocooning is the act of insulating or hiding oneself from the normal social environment. Technology has made cocooning easier than ever before. The internet has made it possible to hardly have to leave your house. You can order things and have them delivered right to your door and not have to deal with a physical person at all. And in our culture of technology, you, you can do the, the necessary passing of information. You know, you just text somebody. You know why I started texting? Because I would call people, young people in particular, I would call people and they wouldn't, wouldn't answer their phone. They wouldn't answer their phone. And, and when I text them, they would answer it. So that's how I got into texting. You know, just to get a response. You know, but, but we can pass information on. We don't have to have a voice-to-voice -voice conversation or a face-to-face -face conversation. We just pass on information like that cocooning. But this cocooning, I see it even apart from technology. Neighborhoods are not what they used to be. Even in college place, in Walla Walla, I have neighbors that come home from work, their garage door opens, their car goes in, the, the garage door comes down, and that's it. Now, that's especially true this time of year. In the wintertime, now I realize in the summertime it warms up and people come outside and they do go for walks or you'll see them working in their yard or something. The nicer weather does bring people outside. But listen, when I was a kid, I lived at 127 Winnebago Street. I was five years old. And I lived in that house for a number of years. And I knew every one of my neighbors. I knew every one of them. I could even tell you their pets' names. Because, because of the way culture was back then. You know, you didn't worry about your kids if you didn't know where they were. Anybody remember those days? My, my mom was just thankful that, you know, I, I've been gone for four hours that I call her from Wayne's house and say, listen, I'm over at Wayne's. Oh, okay, honey, thanks. Today, you can live in a neighborhood and, and not really even know your neighbors. Now, now part of the reason for this is, is our lives are so filled with stuff. 
all the things we need to do, and we, see, we assume we don't have time to really talk to somebody. We avoid conversations with any depth because we, we don't think we have time. This cocooning that is taking place in our society, on this PBS show they were saying that, that this is having a very negative effect on everyone. Now this is, this is a secular program. This lack of healthy interaction with people is affecting people's sense of well-being. It's affecting people mentally and physically. They were saying that people who are in community, now they, they defined that as this, living in healthy relationships with their family and regularly connecting with other people. And they, they used the example, like going to church, particularly those involved in small groups where people are actually opening up with each other. And they said, this is, now this is interesting. They said, these people live longer. They are healthier. They are more fulfilled. And they have this greater sense of well-being. Now, isn't that interesting coming from a secular source? In your notes, there is a need in the heart of every human being, Christian, non-Christian, for a sense of belonging, a sense of, of family, a sense of connection, uh, of community. They're, they're looking for a safe place to be real, to really be themselves, and to be embraced and accepted as themselves to know others, and to be known by others. Fifty years ago, if you had a, a come-to-faith experience, you probably watched Billy Graham on television, or maybe you happened to get invited to a service where the gospel was preached, and you had an opportunity to respond. But, but this is what would happen. You would, you would believe, then you would get connected to a local church, and you would belong. That was the order. Believe, belong. There's an interesting phenomenon happening in the day that we're living in among Gen Xers. That is, they, they have in this heart, their heart this need to belong, this need for community, and they will often come into a community like a church or, or, or various events of a church, and they will, they will begin to belong, then they will believe. Isn't that interesting? It's like the, the cry in their heart for connection is so real that, that they'll, they'll recognize that, they'll respond to that, and in the midst of that, they will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Worship team, come. I just want to read three more verses of Scripture. These, are, these three verses are talking about community. They're talking about fellowship and, and communion. And, and the promises to those who live in community. Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, in, in communion, in, in community, in common unity, in community. These are the promises that God makes to those in community, to those who choose to live in common unity. Verse 2. It is like the precious oil upon the beard running down on the be I'm sorry, oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments. So when, when Aaron was anointed to be the high priest, you know, when they did the anointing of oil back then, they didn't like, you know, put a little bit on the forehead. They, they like dumped oil on you. And the oil went on Aaron, went through his head and in, uh, upon his garment, and see, what he's saying here is that when you choose to live in unity, when, when, when you begin to value one another and walk in love towards one another, that this community, that this common unity, it causes God's anointing to be poured out. This precious oil represents the anointing that God pours out in community. Verse 3, it is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. See, dew in the, in the Bible represents refreshing. At, at one time, the whole earth was watered by a dew system before it rained. 
and, and, and it, it caused the germination and it caused growth. And, and this kind of unity, that this common unity, this community releases the refreshing of God that waters our lives and causes us to be productive. Now, I don't know if you're seeing it yet, but community brings the blessing of God. It is the place where he has commanded his blessing. Could we stand together? Man, I just don't know what to do. I've got 10 minutes. Can I just pray for you today? Put yourself in receive mode. Heavenly Father, we are your kids. You are our Abba Father. And you desire to bless your children. Lord, help us to understand community. Help us to understand what you desire. We want to please you. We want to honor you. Help us to love one another. Help us to love well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.
love that song. It's a prayer. It's a prayer for God to invade our lives. It's a prayer for walls to come down. Some people are living with a wall between God and them. And that wall needs to come down. But also, we can live sometimes where we have walls. We have these things. I, I'm, I'm kind of guarded. You know, I, I'm only going to share so much with you. I, I don't want to. But, but when those walls come down, oh my goodness. When we realize that in community, I can be me. And they actually love me. They actually care about me. And I'm getting to know others too. And we're walking this, this path together and it's getting better and better. Thank you, Lord. Could either prayer teams come? Don't know if anybody needs prayer today, but if you do, it's going to be available. The benediction, actually, let me say this first. If you have problems in your wrists, uh, please see me back there because I want to pray for you this morning. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you.